in the early 1920s that the idea was first floated. So this, we're talking over 20 years before the establishment of the state of Israel, that great friend of the Jews, Joseph Stalin, oh sponsored a region that's on the border of Russia and China. And Lazar Kaganovich, who was known as the most powerful Jew in the Soviet Union, to the point where wherever his name was written, that was the phrase written right afterwards. You think it was his full name. The idea was this. You see, after the Soviet Union was established in 1918, and all anti-Semitism was outlawed, strangely enough, things kept happening, especially when you had instances of Jews coming from the shtetls and from the countryside into the cities looking for work. And shockingly enough, the people in the cities were not delighted by this influx. So the suggestion was made, maybe we could sort of keep the anti-Semitic violence down if we were to move them somewhere else, you know, if they weren't in our face all the time, we might feel much more kindly towards them. So the idea was that they created this region about as far east as you could get, literally on the border with China. Not only was it mostly swamps and mosquitoes, but also poppy fields. So they would very often have um, gangsters coming over from China to make sure that their territory wasn't impunged on. So that was just a fun little, they were even called the red bearded ones. They were basically Chinese mafia would pop over into the area. There was a settlement there called Amarzut, which fun historical fact, the only instance of a Russian settlement being turned into a Jewish one. There are many instances of Jewish settlements being turned into Soviet or Russian settlements. So historically, the only instance in history where a Russian area was actually turned into a majority Jewish area. And here's the really interesting part. Technically, it still exists. You know, what happens later, and then we focus on the next generation with more experience with the, the disillusionment uh, of the Soviet Union. Do you, um, that kind of dynamic of the things that you discuss privately and the things that you discuss publicly, do you find that that was a, a difficult kind of cultural uh, quirk to be uh, capturing? Such a nice word for it. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because my previous book, actually, The Nesting Dolls, yeah. it that piece of it is front and center. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I learned about growing up as the child of Soviet immigrants and the grandchild of Soviet immigrants. And I also saw this among my friends whose parents came from China or from, from Cuba, is this idea that what you think should be connected to what you say yeah. is just bizarre. <laughs> because what you think is for yourself, and what you say is, and long before the term came into vogue, politically correct, so you don't get fired, so you don't get ostracized, so you don't get shot. So, and here's what I find very interesting in that, especially in modern day American culture, there's this emphasis on authenticity, on being yourself, and this idea that if what you say doesn't match what you think exactly, it's some kind of a form of a lie. So to me, that was actually an explicit theme in the nesting dolls, because when you're talking about this kind of generational trauma, for lack of a better word, it's not dishonesty, it's self-preservation. And the fact that people think you should be honest about everything feels actually downright dangerous, if not just strange. The, uh, my own experience with this is, you know, I, I write on Jewish topics, I talk to Jewish audiences, and my parents' uniform response every single time is, I really wish you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> 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 what you're talking about is political themes in a public setting. You never know who's going to be paying attention. Um, and it's, you know, trauma plus time becomes culture, right? Um, it, that's interesting. I've never heard it phrased that way. Yeah, I, I did not coin it. That's from Twitter. But, <laughs> <laughs> I think like there there is these kinds of cultural quirks that um, we all know from our background, but that to an outsider are a very hard to recognize and b even harder to explain. You spent a lot of time, most of your life, in the states. You married here. You have kids here. Uh, what parts of the culture do you find that uh, you're consciously uh, raising your kids with, and the kinds that? you are unknowingly racist. <laughs> oh, well, I think you might have to ask them what the unknowing <laughs> are. But you see, I'm actually very fortunate. I'm fortunate in a lot of ways with who I married. But one of the many aspects of it is my husband is African-American. Wait. <laughs> 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 Just everyone's going to have to take a 
about by the time I'm done. And so he is very much on board with shh in the sense that you shouldn't be out there publicly spewing every thought that you have because you don't know who is listening and um, there are other people in power and the people in power may not like what you say. So I think in that sense, you know, it's, it's very funny. My husband and I talk about how very, very similar we are. Um, in the sense that people say, uh, say, you guys are so different. Like, and you're making that assumption based on, well, I know what you're making that assumption based on, but we're actually very similar, <laughs> both in the way that we were raised from everything from education to respect of your family mm -hmm. and everything else to this cautiousness that the world is not always going to greet you with open arms. So now you'd have to ask my slightly traumatized children, but if, if I may, um, my son and um, his friend actually were in Moldova for a year um, studying Russian. Um, I called it the Junior Spies in America program. Um, the State Department assures you, no, no, it's not that. It's for the study of vital languages, Russian, Korean, Farsi, vital for what? But, anyway, there it is. But, but, but my point is, and as he said to me, he said, you prepared me for everything. Everything, he said, I wish you hadn't been so right about what life in Moldova would be like. So we urged him to be cautious, and apparently we were right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there, there are things that you know, you, you could be writing about and the things that you choose to be writing about. And I, I always find this to be a fascinating thing, particularly of, for writers of, of Russian Jewish backgrounds, a, a compulsion to be writing about specifically Russian speaking Jewish characters. It has to be a, a thing. I, I do this for the longest time. Yeah. As I mentioned, my very first book was a Regency romance. Those of you who are familiar with Bridgerton, that's the genre. <laughs> I snuck Jews into Regency England in my very first book. Later, I found out 20 years later that it was the very first um, Romance Writers of America named it the first own voices, which means it was the first Regency romance with a Jewish character written by a Jewish author. Now, this was in 1994, not 1944, not 1894. It took until 1994 for a Jewish author, Shana, my former agent, Wave, um, is very amused by this. She's disproportionately amused by this. I'm almost not sure why. Um, so, <laughs> so um, I snuck some Jews into Regency England, and then I stopped because guess what? Nobody was buying books about Jews. So I wrote books about average Americans. I have never met an average American in my life, but I wrote books about average Americans. And then I wrote for two soap operas, As the World Turns and Guiding Light. It doesn't get more average American than that, and I did books that tied in with that. So no Russian Jews. A couple of Jews in Regency England, and that's it. No Russian Jews for 20 years. The Nesting Dolls was actually my first book that had Russian Jews in it because for the longest time I wanted to be mainstream. I wanted I didn't want to sit in my own special section at Barnes and Noble. I wanted to be in the general section. So actually, my mother's secret is only my second book that features Russian uh, Jewish characters. And in both cases, with it and the Nesting Dolls, there's a historical section and there's a modern day section. In the Nesting Dolls, it actually takes in present day Brighton Beach. Yay, everyone Brighton Beach. <laughs> and, um, and this one actually takes place, the modern section is the 1980s of San Francisco, California, which is where I grew up. So, I, I will be a bit of a journalist here and do a follow-up question on that. That's why your mother's so proud of you. Yeah. You're so good at what you do. <laughs> um, what inspired the, the return to writing about Jews? People were buying stories about Jews. That's, it's as simple as that. No, it's as simple as that people were not buying stories about Jews. And then the feedback that I got was editors are tired of the Holocaust. They felt that they'd done every possible story, to which point I literally said, I can give you Jews suffering in another time period. <laughs> Too, and I felt a lot of the kinds of Jewish depictions that you would get in that time period would be Seinfeld esque. The where nanny, oh my God, oh, the nanny. God. But I think she was she was explicitly Jewish. Right? She was explicitly yeah. Jewish, but think of all the 
Lakota Jews, Seinfeld, Paul Reiser yeah, in Mad so. About You, um, um, well, Joel Fleshman in um, uh, Northern Exposure. Northern Exposure, right? thank you. See, that's, he's great, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. um, Northern Exposure is a little more explicit about it. But yes, but it was very much that, well, Woody Allen kicks it off, sort of the Nevishi yes. Jewish American stereotype. Yes, that was definitely in the 90s. Um, and I've even written for before your day for um, in Forward and Moment Magazine and other places like that about that kind of representation. You're 100% right. That was all that was seen in the 90s. Yeah, and in that kind of depiction, it was, I get the sense, a lot of Jews who felt uncomfortable publicly talking about Jewish kinds of things. That's never been my experience with Russian Jews. I like to give like a recent anecdote. I uh, encountered a woman through like a social event um, who name was Katerina. You know, not necessarily a given that she's a Jew, but she met me within like a second of talking. She declared that like I am a Jew from the Soviet Union. It's not a, a subtle kind of thing from the Russian speaking community. You want to know where you stand with people very often on these kinds of things. You'd rather not have the surprise later. Do you think that that background played a role in your comfortableness in asserting this, or just the shifting preferences of readers? I think that, yeah, <laughs> well, you definitely have to talk about Gary Steingart and some other authors who had written about a different yeah. representation of American Jews. Because here's the thing I think all of us in this room, we're American Jews. We might be Russian speaking, and we might be from this former Soviet Union, and we might identify with a subset of it, but we're American Jews, the kind of American Jewish representation that you did not see mm -hmm. in the 90s until you get into Gary Steingart and Lara Wagner and yeah. Sadia Kasikava. I mean, and um, there were some really wonderful stories coming out of the community, because I think he grew up. I think that's what it came down to. Um, those of you who need, had ESL for three years, and those <laughs> of us who just were told, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out, we grew up where language did become, where English did become, if not our first language, if not our mother tongue, then at least the one, I'm much more comfortable expressing myself in English. I mean, in Russian, I feel I'm a sound like I'm seven years old, which is what I was, maybe, maybe nine, but that's about it. So I think we all sort of in a critical mass grew up and then started telling our stories the same way, to be fair, that Jerry Seinfeld and Fran Drescher and Paul Reiser were telling their stories. Just a different generation would react in that situation, and then the character grew from there. I love that. That, that is a really great approach. I'm definitely taking some notes for myself <laughs> for the next time we can talk to a publisher. But um, you, know, you write nonfiction. You get to just write things that happen, right? I write opinions, so it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> all find out for yourselves afterwards uh, how much you agree with it. But um, you know in these in these stories you have are there any characters that you identify with personally or do you try to uh, remove yourself from that for the sake of telling a more compelling story? I think you have to identify with all your characters when you write fiction and, and actually nonfiction too when you cover um, people like that. But I think, because, you know, it's the whole thing about no villain ever sees themselves as a villain. Nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks evil thoughts and twirls their mustache and says, I'm going to go out and ruin the world. I'm so not Star Wars. But. <laughs> not, I love Star Wars, but not known for its depth of character. <laughs> so, um, but the thing is, so there's a little bit of understanding, or at least an attempt at understanding, because those people who presided over the show trial, during Stalin's purges, both before World War II and after, I'm sure they believed what they were doing was for the good of the Soviet Union. There's a movie with Greta Garbo called Ninochka from the 1930s, where her line is, there will be fewer but better Russians. <laughs> so it's the same idea that people actually thought they were making the world a better place. So even with the characters who come off as villains in the story, I didn't just say they woke up and decided they wanted to torture people. I tried to figure out where they were coming from, with the understanding that even good people are also selfish and are interested in getting ahead and are interested in getting the girl or whatever it is. Just like good people aren't all good, bad people aren't all bad. Everyone has a reason for what they do, or at least they think 